um, I've got the all envied right after lunch spot. So um, hopefully everyone will be um, awake and alert for this talk. Um, I have to apologize a little bit. Um, I, my voice isn't usually this low. I got a cold yesterday, and I'm doing well to be standing in front of you. Um, my name is Jim Hughes. So um, shout if you have any questions as we go through this. I'll be talking about GeoMesa today and uh, some of the community that we're building with Location Tech and some of the problems that we're solving today have solved and some of the things that we'll be addressing as we go forward. Okay, so GeoMesa is a distributed spatiotemporal database. We live on top of Accumulo, which is in the Hadoop ecosystem. And through the use of GeoTools and uh, GeoServer, we provide access to open standards defined by the OGC. And I find it really great that we're a part of Location Tech. There have been a number of good conversations this week where other projects, GeoWave, GeoTrellis, and um, a number of other people have had a chance to interact with us and tell us what we've got right and where we can do things better. So. Um, since I have the opportunity to go in the middle of the day, I had a chance to uh, you know, say some things about uh, the talks that we've already heard as part of the big day today. Uh, GeoMace is written in Scala, so um, I don't want to you know, dwell on that too much. We are focused on being part of a polygot solution on the JVM. So the great thing is we work with GeoServer and GeoTools. If you write in plain Java, if you write in Clojure, you can use what we're creating. You don't have to uh, come over to uh, the fully functional programming side of the world. Although um, Evan Chan and I would definitely invite you to do so. Scala's the best solution. We've got ACA. No. Okay, anyhow, uh, we'll set aside the language wars for a minute. Okay, so the two parts of my talk are really gonna be to define what my title's about and try to make a small difference between what just a database is and when you can say, I've got a little bit of a computational framework. And I want to make this distinction to point out that if you're a database, you answer queries in some language and return a result set that the client then interacts with. On the other hand, if you're a computational framework, you hand over a query and you hand over some sort of function and you say, I want the result of this function applied to my result set. I don't want to see the result set. So this fits in the functional programming environment that Hadoop MapReduce, Scalding, Spark, all sort of work with. So this story is going to sound very familiar. In general, um, if you went to the two talks this morning, a lot of what I have to say is going to sound pretty familiar, which should be comforting, especially with the after lunch slump. Okay. So why would you want to use GeoMesa? Um, how can I convince you to uh, participate in our community instead of looking at things like PG Shard and other things like that? Well, the answer is we're on the JVM and we do work in this Hadoop environment. So we're also trying to have a solution that's going to scale up to millions and billions and trillions of points and lines and polygons, of course. Okay. Currently, we're built on Accumulo. All the key value stores kind of look the same after a while, so we're hoping we can relax that at some point, and that's, but that's future work. Um, in the second part, I'll talk a little bit about what I mean for us to be a computational framework. Okay, as an example data set where it worked for us on GeoMesa about a year and a half ago, and we didn't have great success with PostGIS, we loaded up GDELT, which is the global data, uh, the global da data on event language and tone. And at the time that we were working with it, it had about 213 million points, which, well, we've got experts in here for whom that's a tiny amount of data, but for the geo community, that's probably looking pretty big. So that's an example data set that we like to play with since it's a little bit beyond the threshold where we were, at least we were able to get PostGIS to work well. Okay, so 
to, keep, to restate it, we want to use GeoMesa when your traditional approach won't scale up well. And you do have to bring your own cloud or you know, buy one. And we're also part of the free and open source community, obviously. We're here at Phosphor G, happy to be here. And so that's part of what is going on. In terms of scaling up, you've got options. You could go back and try to find a commercial solution, see what opportunities exist there. It might be a little bit expensive. Um, if your application has lots of data and has some way to split it up, you could figure out a way to do application level sharding. And Evan Chan, with our lead off talk this morning, talked about that a little bit where he said, okay, I've got data that looks like this. If I know that someone's gonna ask about San Francisco, maybe I can have the San Francisco table and database. And maybe that'll work out well. And that works up to a point. The downside is that it feels like a custom solution each time. And that can be expensive for your internal development efforts. The third option, you can just say, well, we'll process all our data offline. We don't have to worry about making things accessible to an end web user. And in a web 2.0 and beyond world, that's not an attractive option. So next thing you've got to do is take it to the cloud. Okay, so a little bit about the Hadoop infrastructure. Hadoop starts with the Hadoop distributed file system. Once we're on top of HDFS, that provides the resiliency we need for a distributed database to actually work. And that's where something like Accumulo or HBase or Cassandra comes in. They can provide access to our data in a distributed manner. We hook into that in a few ways. Accumulo iterators, uh, we'll talk about them in a moment, give us a chance to filter the data and transform it. And on top of that, we can enable MapReduce, Spark, and Storm uh, connectivity. All of that we're tying in so that we can uh, play with the experts in the JVM GeoServer or JVM uh, Geospatial World, namely the GeoTools and GeoServer projects. So they've already come through and solved a lot of problems about how do I access this data once it's um, in a certain form and what can someone do with it? How do I actually serve it to someone to put points on a map? So as you're talking about Accumulo, we've got to go through the usual things and Eugene mentioned some of this already. It's a big table clone. It's a key value store. Um, one of the distinguishing factors in the beginning is it had cell level security. It also has the server side um, um, computation, computational uh, extension points named iterators. And you know, it's a lot of fun. Okay, so HDFS is the substrate that Accumulo and HBase and things like that are built on. And our keys that we have are split up and we basically have a triple of location information where we say, I've got a row ID, a column, fel column family, and a column qualifier. The visibility and timestamp help control access and uh, versioning information. That key's mapped to a value. So the great thing about this is we have a sorted key value view of the world and the different keys are split up into tablets and those tablets are shared across multiple servers. This gives us a chance to partition things and spread out the data. And all of this sounds a little complicated, but the great analogy that we can give for Accumulo and for HBase is to say, you should really think of a multi-volume encyclopedia. If you have your encyclopedia set in front of you and someone says, look up the word aardvark, you know which block, which server, which volume to pull from, and then there may be an additional index inside there that helps you get to the exact piece of data you want very quickly. On the other hand, if in grade school uh, you were a bad kid and you had to copy things out of the dictionary, someone may say, start at elephant and copy to the word fox. And that's where the linked list structure that you get um, in, the, in Accumulo helps you make sequential reads to go through that very quickly. All right, um, 
Accumulo indexes one-dimensional data. And, well, we don't have one-dimensional data. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. We've already had a chance to talk about um, needing to have an approach where we take one dimension, uh, multi-dimensional data and reduce it down to one dimension. So in two dimensions, something like a geohash or z-order curve fits to the bill. We can start in the lower left and we can visit all the grids in this picture. And we now know what we mean uh, to say that one grid cell is before or after another. So as Eugene mentioned, we've got this SF curve project where a number of us are trying to get the details of something very simple, make sure we do them right, and make sure that we have a solution that we can point to. OK. Excuse me for one second. Let's talk about computation for a moment. So one of the things that we can do is if we just pull back the data, say this could be from a Twitter feed in Northern Virginia. If we pull back the data and we just throw it on a map, it might not look too great. So we know that some areas are, have, you know, we can see that there's some center area here that's getting lots of uh, attention or has lots of people tweeting there. But we really want to see a map more like this, where we can understand the densities where people are. And this is our first example of one of the things we can call on our Accumulo iterators to do. So what we can do is every time we're reading a piece of information, we have three main uh, functional programming options that we can do. We can filter it and just say, let's skip it. And that's how we handle all the database and query side of things. The other thing we can do is we can say, I want to transform it. And I've also got an iterator has a view of a certain number of um, entries. So then we can aggregate those entries into one result. Here what we can see is that we're mapping and aggregating. So we've got a little tiny map and a little reduce step that we can execute on each tablet server. So all the red points in the left are all across my cluster. And now as I'm generating the heat map, I can ask each tablet server to go ahead and say which uh, cell in the resulting image they would go into and then build up a little count for each cell. And once I pull it back, I can have GeoServer help me render a nice uh, density map like this. So as another example of some computation we can perform, we at one point um, had DB scan clustering. And this has a chance to do clustering where our shapes are a little bit arbitrary and where you don't have to tell your machine learning algorithm ahead of time, this is how many clusters I want. With k means, k is the number of clusters you're going to have. And you usually go through a step where you say, well, I don't know how many clusters I like, so I'm going to run the algorithm repeatedly with two clusters and three clusters and so on. And I'm going to compare my answers and see which answer I like the best. So dbscan is a little bit uh, better than that. So here we can see uh, we've drawn circles to indicate where there are some clusters of uh, Twitter information after um, the incident at Ferguson near St. Louis. OK. So this is great. As we were talking about big data, I'm obligated to say something about Spark. So this is the uh, canonical example that my boss cooked up whenever he said, let's have Spark support. He needed to have a quick example to work through. And his goal was to build up a time series. So he was going to take some uh, data set, maybe GDELT, and fire it up, get an RDD of simple features, and then bend them by day. OK, so I won't say much more about what Spark is. Um, if you've got questions about it, uh, we can definitely chat afterwards. Our goal is that at the end of it, we're going to be able to visualize what we've got with uh, our time series in R. OK, so I want to show a little bit of code to show how simple it is and how expressive Scala is for what we're doing, and also to point out where we tie into GeoTools and how we tie into Spark. 
So the first block is the map of parameters that you need to say, hey, GeoTools, give me a data store. Once we get that on more or less the next line, we can go through and select, uh, build up a filter where we say we want things that are inside this bounding box. And with that query in mind, what we can do on the bottom line is we can say to GeoMesa, hey, give me back an RDD of simple features. And now, wherever my data is in the cluster, on those nodes, Spark is going to pull it straight out of Accumulo and have an RDD that's spread, spread across all my nodes. Okay, next thing that we wanna do is we wanna take our RDDs, we wanna call out to each of those partitions that's on each node, tell them how they can build up their time series locally. So we have a little transformation there. And finally in the bottom block, we're going to say, I've got all this data, I've got all these little time series or computations that are worth a time series across my cluster. I want to group them together and then bring them back to my uh, machine and finally write out the results. Okay, so in two slides, we've managed to use our distributed computational framework to call out, do everything, and it's wonderful. We can leverage something like R. We've got a pretty picture. Okay, so that's a you know, quick example of using something with Spark. And that's along the top, of, top line of this picture here, where we can say, okay, if we use Spark and R, we can build up this time series. On the other hand, our first two examples worked with GeoServer. They were available to the web. People could actually get to them. Do we have a better way? Can we sort of combine these two together or uh, push some of the computation from Spark to Accumulo? Okay, so um, that's, the, that's the story sometime over the summer, sometime in the fall. I went on a walk with my friend and coworker, Tim, and Tim is the guy behind a project that we have called Mantis, where what you do is you say, I've got interesting data. It could be words or documents or images. And you say, I want to be able to do linear algebra on them. For example, if you said king minus man plus woman, you should get to queen. So you want to have a vector space where you can do that kind of computation. And Google has a paper called word to vec where they work out doing that. And at CCRI, we've got lots of experience playing the same sort of games with neural networks and doing this with other things besides just words. <laughs> okay, so I go on this walk with my friend Tim. He says, I've got this data and it's in super high dimension, super high dimensional space, 300, 10,000 dimensions, whatever. He does have a projection down to two dimensional space. So he says, can I put my data in GeoMesa? And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I guess all you have to do is make sure to scale it, you know, between the longitude and latitude restrictions that we have, and you can dump your data in. So as we're talking, he's also saying, I'm gonna need some computation. My points that I'm putting in are going to have a little map of strings to integers. And at some point, I'm gonna to wanna to be able to click a button, pull back all the way, um, do a little search, and pull back aggregations of those maps of strings to ints. And if you think about that, and you think about the density, and you think about the time series, you realize that we're really just doing map and reduce computations. So, we should be thinking, how can we do this with Accumulo iterators? Okay, that's where I came up with the idea that we should have a temporal density iterator, the same way that the first example was a spatial density iterator. And we could have an iterator for Tim's project. Um, the great name that we've got for it is the Mantis iterator because, well, there you go. Um, and there might be other times whenever the computation that you're looking for is just a map step and a reduce step. So this is not, it does not support the full scope of Hadoop's MapReduce um, format uh, or computational framework. You could sit and think about it, doing things like shuffling and some of the other steps there, not really gonna work out. But 
a lot of computations, especially as you're exploring your data, are pretty simple. Okay, so one of the great things that we've got in terms of working with community is Location Tech encouraged us to participate with Facebook's Open Academy. We did that in the fall of 2014, and um, you can see me and the five students and their mentor, Glenn Downing. Um, we were just down the road at Facebook's headquarters for the Code Sprint, and for their project, they sorted out the details of this temporal density iterator. They cooked up some unit tests, wrote it up as a WPS process so that we can have the answer come out of GeoServer. And they started work on a UI to show this time series. So we're continuing with a different group of students. And I was actually able to um, bring in another location tech project. Um, I got GeoTrellis and Rob Emanuel to come down to Austin. And we have two projects that GMS is uh, working on. The first one is we're hoping to put together a small UI to uh, demonstrate some of these kind of data exploration analytics, like the temporal density iterator, um, in a UI that we can put, you know, give to GeoServer, uh, put, have show up in GeoServer. And we're also, um, Rob and I are sharing some students who are working on um, exploring geohashes, Hilbert curves, and other space filling curve implementations as we chat about that. And the SF curve project is where all that's going to get worked out. It's a brand new location tech project uh, that we uh, submitted um, a few weeks ago at the FOA code sprint. And I don't want to make this sound like we're doing anything too terribly novel, but this will give us a chance to communicate to all the projects that need a solution for multidimensional indexing to get it down to one dimension, put it all in one place, have some good documentation, and if we don't have, if we're not the smartest people in the room and we don't have the best implementation, provide interfaces for you to hook your better solutions into. So. Okay. Um, we've just implemented some raster support and we're hopefully going to be working with GeoTrellis and uh, GeoWave to sort out some of the details there. Since this is a talk about computation, one of the things I want to emphasize is we have a few models as we think about rasters that we could, your computation could fall into. And I'm, I'm talking about this computation so that as you think about your problems, you'll be able to work with us and tell us where you fit in. In the first model, if we're doing an operation that works pixel by pixel, we can operate tile by tile, and each tile is a different entry in our key value store. At that point, we can um, you know, do something like a map task where we just transform each tile. And I actually did this in a scalding job, but um, there's no reason we couldn't do it in an Accumulo iterator. So we also have map reduce possibilities. You might want to calculate a histogram or a time series like Eugene was uh, doing with GeoTrellis earlier today. And another of the examples that Eugene had was that we could create our image pyramid where we take four tiles on one side and we say, I'm going to admit them by a smaller or, or less fine or coarser geohash. And once I get them together in the reducer, I can produce a smaller tile that is higher in the image pyramid. And Let's see. Um, another example that is worth talking about that, uh, we, that I didn't have a chance to sort out for GeoMesa is the GeoTrellis guys talk about focal operations where you want to do, um, you want to run a kernel past all the points in your um, raster. And for that, you have to do some clever things to make sure to figure out how to, um, Sorry, my cold's getting to me. Uh, you have to figure out how to return adjacent tiles so that you can work with them efficiently. OK. By way of a conclusion, um, GeoMesa, we're handling big geo data. And for some of the computational things that we want to do, um, 
we can use accumulo iterators to address those problems. The nice thing about doing that is we have ways to hook into GeoServer and GeoTools so that we can return results directly to the user without needing to kick off MapReduce jobs, without needing to hold on to a Spark context. Both of those are a little bit diff difficult as you start to think about um, how you can interact with the user in an effective way. So some of the discussion this morning made it clear that our community of big geo data is also going to have to learn from the uh, big data community to figure out how to scale user interactions. So some of the discussion after Evan Chan's talk was, how is this gonna work out? How can your Spark processing framework handle it as multiple users interact? How can GeoTrellis work as you have multiple users all trying to work at the same time? So in general, we've got a lot to learn there in terms of from the big geo community or from the big data community as we build a big geo community. And location tech is going to be where a lot of that's uh, worked out. So for GeoMesa, we've got geomesa.org to get you started. We also have a user list and our code is up on location tech. Um, I do have some slides I skipped over that might address particular questions that people might have. So there's some bonus slides. I think I've probably got another five minutes, so I'm happy to take some questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, did Spatial Hadoop become GeoGenie? Yep. So um, I haven't had a chance to look at GeoGenie and I haven't had a chance to look at MRGeo too closely. My understanding is that those projects, and please correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that those projects are focused on, I have my data at rest, it's not in a database, I'm gonna run a MapReduce job on it to perform my computation. So. We're trying to solve the problem of putting points on a map and letting users interact more in an online fashion. So that said, as, things, as, um, as we progress, we will want to try to figure out how we can work with data at rest and kind of build up the Lambda, Lambda architecture where we could say, okay, if you've got raster data, you might not want to put it in your database or if you are putting, in a, putting it in the database, certain restrictions are happening. Um, I work with a number of um, honest to goodness scientists. I'm a mathematician. So um, whenever we said, oh, we've got this raster project, we're gonna start putting raster data in. I said, hey, it's great. We'll use GDAL warp to get it in to 4326 and then Bob's your uncle. And they're like, no, you're going to kill a pixel. Um, so. To some degree, I feel like there needs to be a backend solution that's married up with some of these database solutions so that we can figure out what processing we're doing where. Good question. Other questions? Yes. Uh, at the risk of sounding naive, databases started with uh, one-dimensional uh, indexes, yep. like B3, and then they moved on to supporting n dimensional by a native and dimensional mm -hmm. indexes such as R3. So I was wondering, why do we have to go through the space filling curve? Why mm. are the R3 support into uh, a cubicle? Okay, Andrea asked the best big question of the day, which is, why don't we just distribute our better data structures? And this is a tough question because, I mean, if we could distribute R trees, KD trees, so on, we might get some big benefits. Um, there is a project that actually forked Accumula 1.4 that tried this approach. And in order to do that, you wind up having to re rewrite about a third of Accumulo. And that project hasn't been able to keep up as Accumulo's gone forward. So the difficult challenge that we have, and um, whenever I speak about the data structures more generally, I, I do make a point to say that 
big table, whenever they said, um, you know, we need to talk about how we're going to work out big data. In 2006 or so, when big table comes out, a, uh, Google is actually basically going scorched earth. And they're going back to the 1970s and saying, you know, this is the thing that we can distribute. So um, for my money, I think what you would have to do is someone would have to come along and be smart enough to write a Cumulo in a more pluggable way or write HBase in a more pluggable way where I don't care as much about the file that's on disk. And at that point, they would be providing hooks for someone to say, I have a KD tree or I have an R tree. In general, some of the balancing issues that you get with R trees, I think, are going to um, give people lots of headaches. Um, and not just the headache I have with my cold. Um, it's going to give a lot of trouble as you try to figure out how we can scale out and still maintain some of the things that we like in a structure like that. So um, it is one of the unfortunate things. Um, R trees are well understood at this point. And whenever someone says, I have a particular algorithm I want to run, I want the k nearest neighbors to a point, you can go read tens, dozens of papers that tell you exactly how to do that with an R tree. If you have a distributed database system, as you provide KN and support, which we have, by the way, there was a paper mistaken about that, um, you have to repeatedly query the database and kind of go um, your query window around there. Um, other questions? Yes, I'll take you and then, yes. Is there a way of querying GeoMesa that does not involve GeoServe or involves the process of Geo? So if you, if you want to speak um, to us at the moment for you know, features on the web, that's the way we go is through WFS. On the other hand, we implement the GeoTools data store interface. So you're completely free to write a Java process that hooks into that. You'll get out simple features. The query language, the common query language, um, it's called CQL. It's not to be confused with the Cassandra query language. Um, but that query language is very simple. And uh, do you have something in particular that you'd like to do? No, I'm just wondering yeah. whether that was the only way in. No. So if you are writing another Java process, you can connect directly via GeoTools, and you're off to the races. Our quick start tutorial actually gives that as an example, where uh, we cook up a few points, throw them in the database, and then make some queries to get them out real quick. Yes? Okay, so I'll answer the question. It sounds like we've got two questions. One's how is the data distributed? If we just use a geohash or just use a linear ordering, we've got the data in one order. The downside that you have at that moment is popular places like San Francisco, for instance, or Washington, DC, or in the GDELT data set, the point zero, zero, all go to the same row, and you're stuck. What do you do? Because that kind of sucks, right? I mean, you have a query, and you're going to hit one server, and that's not going to work too well. Our solution to this, and this is configurable, is you can provide a little hint. We'll use the number of tablet servers if you don't provide an override. What we'll do is, say you have 20 tablet servers, we're going to roll a number between you know, 1 and 20 for each piece of data. And that gives us a chance to prepend a little random number. That way, all of our data for San Francisco winds up spread across the whole cloud. OK, this is a trade-off. You don't get a free lunch. I mean, it's included in the conference, but it's not completely free. So the trade-off is if you've spread your data across all of your servers, you don't know that you're done until the last server returns. On the other hand, though, this gives us a chance to have our processing 
hit on all the machines in, this, in the cloud and work things out. Okay. In terms of raster processing, if we need to do a focal operation where we are running a kernel past every point in a raster, the trick to pull, and you could do this in a MapReduce job, the trick to pull would be to pull back a tile for a geohash, and now what you're going to do is you're going to enumerate it um, with every with its geohash and the eight geohashes around it. And so now you can say, I'm right here, and I'm also you know, next to these other ones. You can group by geohash, and now what will happen is for the geohash you group by, since that geohash emitted, was emitted nine times for it and its neighbors, and that happened for all of its neighbors, you can say, I'm at this geohash, and you actually have the nine tiles next to you. So that's the quick solution to that. Yeah. Oh, I'm out of time. So um, if you've got other questions, we've got a booth. Um, so come by and see me. I, you know, yeah, thanks. <laughs>